Excellent. We're live. Hi, everyone. We know that there's a small delay between us broadcasting and it being visible on YouTube. So um, we are just going to wait for some people to join. And in the meantime, um, for those of you who are looking forward to this webinar, you might have heard of Dr. Jamie Pringle. Um, he definitely hasn't been coerced or encouraged or bullied or harassed into doing this at all it's completely on a voluntary basis JP right, <laughs> right. Um, and I'll let him fill in a little bit more about his background um, but if you haven't heard of Jamie then you definitely will know someone that has I think the degrees of separation tend to be two or three with you JP um, so Jamie's going to talk about performance modelling and this is a pretty interesting topic so I'll hand over to JP now, we'll get his presentation up on screen and I'm going to disappear for the foreseeable but I'll be lurking so if anyone's got any questions please put them in the comments box and we can go through them at the end. All right, thanks JP, over to you now. Great, thanks Bianca. Um, and thanks for the invitation. Um, and as Bianca says there, um, if you've got questions as we go through this, <clears throat> please fire them into the comments box and we'll try and pick them up. And I'll try and keep an eye on them as we go through the session as well, um, because that will give me a good a good sense of what's resonating with you and what's what are the important things for the people who are who are who are listening live. Um, so, so thanks for the invitation. It's really nice to um, to come and chat with you. My name is Jamie Pringle. Um, <clears throat> Bianca did coerce me a little bit into this, but that's absolutely fine because I've uh, got no problems with that. Um, our paths really have crossed uh, a number of times over the years, but most importantly, and probably most significantly, through this project that Bianca and I were both involved with a couple of years ago, the Boardman Performance Centre uh, over in Evesham. <clears throat> and I'm going to put this up and I just want to pull some, um, if you like, some examples from what we did there because they actually set the scene for tonight's session and for tonight's topic really quite nicely. The Bourbon Performance Centre was really a, a team of individuals, a team of practitioners, scientists, engineers, and in Bianca's case, medics who were working in cycling. And our real mission there, our goal there, was to take effectively what was once the domain of world-class cycling and bring it to the public. <clears throat> now, I'm sure you have heard of the name, and if you're old enough like me, you'll remember Chris as, a, as an athlete himself, as a rider himself. Um, but Chris's legacy at the sport, really, um, not just now in terms of participation, but as an athlete himself, he was a pioneer. He was an in innovator and he was an aerodynamicist as an athlete, a really great physiologist as an athlete. He knew how his body worked. And it was those roots of his own performance that he wanted to bring into bringing that to the general public. <clears throat> and most importantly, for me, he entrusted that vision to myself and to a couple of other individuals to take that vision, that experience that he'd had, and bring it to the general public. I'm not I'm always never quite sure about this picture. It looks like I'm explaining the catch of the trout I've just found in the in the river. Um, and the Bourbon Performance Centre was a, uh, a centre based around cycling with triathlon as well, and anything that's to do with the bike. And of course, that the headline of that, and I know you you guys have heard about this quite a lot before and we're going to do a lot of it on it tonight was aerodynamics and the wind tunnel was really the the heartbeat of that center but not just the aerodynamics and the wind tunnel side we put around that the biomechanics side of things you can see bianca in this shot here with the motion analysis and the kinetics the force analysis as well and of course we actually put on alongside that the um uh, physiotherapy provision within that through bianca and other people we, we would get in for podiatry and so on and so forth. And the bit where I got involved specifically in terms of service provision in the physiology, so understanding the physical capabilities of the individual. So a real multidisciplinary uh, approach to being able to take service provision to any level of athlete, not just the world-class rider. Um, we've migrated, if you like, migrated that service provision over to a new home. And um, Bianca and myself and David um, have taken that real sort of those concepts and brought them over to Silverstone to under the company called Vortec, um, who I'm consulting for now with Bianca. And really, I guess this is the essence of it, this slide here, the integration of biomechanics of physicality with aerodynamics. And the combination of the two really is probably the USP of that particular, um, particular offering through that company. 
I'm going to talk a lot about this. I'm going to talk about the individual on the screen there, not Bianca and David, but the, the rider, um, Lucy Charles there. Uh, I'm also going to talk about this guy as well uh, quite a bit tonight. Um, I say this guy, the guy who's on the bike um, in the in the Silverstone wind tunnel there with Vortec. Uh, and of course, that's Alex Stouser, the rider. You'll recognize him. And you might recognize the fellow in the background as well, which I'll come on to in a second. <clears throat> and I wanted to start with this example. Um, so really, tonight's session is about performance modeling, what it takes to win what it takes to achieve and how we can understand that and hopefully in this case make it better and make it um and make it take a, an athlete's performance to the next level so the real focus on on performance on pushing the pushing the boundaries in some cases of, of what it what can be achieved but most importantly having a model of understanding how performance is created and how the athlete is able to to deliver that and my session i want to do now is really a, a two-part aspect of physics on one hand and physiology on the other. And let me see if we can take you through this example. But I wanted to start with what was actually quite a sophisticated example, and it dates back to two Tour de Francis to, uh, ago. And you might remember that this was the final scene on the final day of Pogaccio winning that yellow jersey over Roglic. And what had happened the day before was this, the time trial up to that top of that mountain where unfortunately Roglic kind of fell apart and his performance fell apart. And Pogaccia put quite a, a significant margin into him uh, and took the yellow jersey. And of course, as we know, the, the, the story is that he took that into, into Paris and won the tour. And specifically about his performance on that day and a couple of other riders there, and I'm gonna give you an example in a moment, we'll just put it up now, of how they actually took that performance and delivered it on the road, how they paced it, how they paced it according to physical power, their effort, and according to the terrain, in this case, a mountain finish. It was a flat time trial to start with, up to about two thirds, three quarters of the way through, and then it was that climb up the mountain. And Pogaccia's pacing on that day was really, really quite significant and quite important to how he went about to win that race and win that stage and win the race overall. Now this is not him. So if you if you scan your eyes over to the right hand side of the screen, this is not actually him. This is another rider who was riding on the tour that that uh, another top ten rider who was riding on the tour that day. And this is an example of how that race and that stage, and I'll put up the detail here, of that race and that course have been broken into a fifty part model of performance, of power, and pacing according to areas in the race where there were there were opportunities to push on up the hills and you can see how the power is higher here on the on the uphills to back off a little bit on the downhills and you can see how the power is lower here on this downhill section and of course then the final 20 percent 15 percent of the race is up the steep hill and it's give it all you've got and that's where you've got to empty the tank it's a good, really good example of performance modeling where in this case the physics the aerodynamics of the rider meet uh, and are constrained by the physiological capacities of the rider. And in this specific case, because we're talking about endurance athletes, their critical power. I'm gonna put that up now, and I'm gonna come back to it as, the, as our kind of final slide, our final um, thrust in this, in this session. Um, because what sits behind this, really that meeting of physics on one hand and physio physiology on the other, has really been my um, bread and butter for the last, um, the last decade or so. Now that looks, um, quite sophisticated. There are, you can go and do this yourself. If you know some of your numbers, you can go onto something like Best Bike Split, put in your data, tell, tell them what course you're gonna ride and it will give you an insight as to how you should maybe pace yourself and push around that course. So people are doing this now commercially uh, and making good profit from it and doing quite well. Um, it's the real sort of instigation for me actually dates back a good 15 years ago. Um, and the reason why I said this guy at the back here in the blue jumper is quite important. That's Michael Hutchinson, who's a rider I've worked with or I did used to work with it when he was an athlete um, for many years through his career. I'm putting him up there because it was actually his performance in the Commonwealth Games in 2006 that really pushed him and I both into this area, not just of performance modeling and trying to understand how we um, improve his performance, but the aerodynamics as well. And at the bottom right picture there is the Mercedes wind tunnel with uh, Simon Smart, uh, myself and Michael in the tunnel there trying different um, different clothing options. The reason I put that up is because 
Michael got fourth that day, and Nathan O'Neill, the guy who won the Australian, who won on home soil, who had a stamp made after him with his image on it, had been paced around that race by his director sitting in the car with an earpiece in the rider's ear, pacing him through every section and every little hill and every little turn and every little um, bit of headwind and tailwind with a specific power number to hit. And on the back of that, we thought, oh, there's something in this about how we deliver this uh, effort around the race. And of course, um, and as I say, that has been the, if you like, the motivation that's probably driven me in this area for the last, um, the last decade and a half. Because as we know, every what is precious. Now, I know if you've watched the Cycling Physios um, webinars before, you will have seen um, a number of previous contributors talking about um, Aerodynamics 101. Well, actually, I'm actually going to go for Aerodynamics it's more 102 because I want to pick up on some of the stuff that Barney would have talked about in the previous um, sessions and also about power as well and how and why that um, why we need to have that understanding of power when it comes into this. Because this is effectively what we're dealing with. This is the performance model. This is the relationship between the speed and the power it takes you to achieve that speed on a bike. Uh, in this case, and you can see straight away, there's not a linear relationship. It's that curve of linear relationship. And there are other components, not just the aerodynamics, but there are other components. There's aspects around the uh, friction of the drive chain, the rolling resistance of your tires, which is quite significant. But you can see that the predominance of the power requirements of a rider is from air resistance, the aerodynamics. And that sort of competitive race speeds, 25 miles an hour, 40 kph and beyond, more than 20%, more than 15% of your, of more than, 84%, I should say, less than 15%, uh, more than 84% of your effort is just pushing air out the way. And even at the lower speeds, 30 kilometers now, three quarters of your effort is still pushing air out the way on the flat. Now, if you've got this sort of aerodynamic pro uh, sort of properties, a coefficient of drag area, and we'll use that number quite a bit, of 0.34, that's pretty average. It's pretty poor for a time trial ride. It's very poor. It's pretty average for, for a road rider. But then the good examples of athletes and individuals where, in this case, Miguel Indurain, phenomenal, powerful athlete, not very aerodynamic, able to break the hour record, though, but with some big power numbers, like we say. And of course, Chris himself, um, you know, pushing the limits of performance, and that's still that hour record of 56.375 kilometers is still not being beaten. Um, and an effort that is probably a pinnacle of physiological capacity as well as exceptional aerodynamic performance. Bear in mind that picture, that record is 25 years old. And then you get the Mavericks, people who are incredibly aerodynamic and have figured out a different way of doing it. Graham O'Brien had a much more modest power, dare I say, still pretty good, but not in the 440, 450 watt region that Borman was doing with one of his contemporaries but still able to break the hour record. Because people have understood how to move the aerodynamic profile on. And in, in this case, an exceptionally good aerodynamic profile um, with a coefficient of drag area of 0.165 would be representative of a really good, uh, a really good um, setup for a rider, reducing the power output for um, <clears throat> any, any given speed. I'll just go back to that. And of course, increasing the speed for any given power very significantly and that really is our first kind of um reference point on this idea of performance modeling of what does good look like what does poor look like what does average look like what does exceptional look like and these isoplets as they're called here around speed and power really sort of, um, tell that story and um, of course this is what we're trying to do with any aerodynamic optimization uh, is shift somebody towards the purple from the uh, from the lower the lower echelons there and those sort of individuals some of them were pushing the limits and pushing the boundaries in their days and of course you know as i say what we're trying to do and i'll just give you a little bit of an insight into sort of a wind tunnel session that you might do with a rider you're trying to reduce that power for the given speed um or actually what's more significant in terms of understanding that is reducing increasing the speed for a given power and in most wind tunnel sessions that we do with a rider, we're looking in the region of about 10 to 20 watts of power saving that you can get around about half a kilometer an hour to maybe a kilometer an hour faster, sometimes more. And that's 
all about figuring out how the rider is riding on the bike and how much that wind is pushing back. I just wanted to put this little graphic up just to show you because some people when we're talking about aerodynamics said, well, how do you actually measure it? Well, we're measuring the pushback, the aerodynamic drag force that the, that wind is pushing the rider back. And you can see the riders on a turntable that's effectively a weighing scale, not just weighing in that direction, but weighing in that um, forward aft direction as well. And it's an incredibly precise piece of kit. It's an incredibly precise weighing scale. So any small changes that we're looking at in, in terms of um, aerodynamics, we can pick up, we can measure, and we can interpret them and, and believe them with confidence that they are, they are real. And as I say, it's all about trying to find small gains as you go through a session. This is a rider, an example of a rider where you're, you're changing little bits of the, uh, their setup, their position, their contact points. And in this case, some aspects around helmets and skin suits as you go through a session there. Just pick those things out, some big changes there around changing, um, in this case, arm position for the rider, having some big effects. So I just wanted to give you that little bit of an insight as to what it looks like um, when you're actually in the wind tunnel with the rider and the sort of level of kind of performance you can achieve. And the fella back on the screen there is our next example that I want to talk about in terms of physiological and, and physics aerodynamic modeling, because this is Alex. And his target in two weeks time um, is to break the hour record and to go and ride and beat Victor Campenart's record of 55.08 kilometers. Um, and Alex is going off to Mexico, um, to Aguascalantes um, Velodrome in Mexico at altitude to have a crack at that record. And Alex has spent a lot of time in the Vortec wind tunnel, um, not just himself, but also um, quite interestingly, a 3D mannequin of him. And there's Alex on the top um, the top right there, because this is a really nice way that we what we do at Vortec is, yes, we bring the athlete into the wind tunnel, but also we can create a mannequin of them. So wherever they are in the world, we can still work with them uh, figuratively in the wind tunnel. And we can actually even get the, the mannequin pedaling, which is quite a, uh, quite a funky thing to be able to do. So we can test clothing we can test equipment around that rider helmets clothing any interaction with the bike and, and the rider um, we can do that like i say without actually the rider needing to be present there that's quite a, it's quite a, a real <clears throat> a real sort of advancement in the in the technology now let's move our little guy on what does it take to bring to break uh, break these records well the example i want to use is that our record and that altitude um, scenario, that the dynamic of it, because that brings in a whole level of the physiological side of things that we need to understand alongside the aerodynamics. And this is the current record holder, Victor Campanets. Um, coefficient of drag area estimated about 0.175. Um, and I'll, I'll pick up on the altitude aspect in a second, but a power output for that race of about 350 watts, maybe a little bit below. Um, to achieve that 55.09 kilometers an hour performance. And he did that, uh, as we've already talked about, at altitude, which at Aguascalantes in, in Mexico is the highest indoor velodrome. And you can see just on the screen here, just shy of 2,000 meters, uh, 1,870 meters. But we know when the athlete goes to altitude, there's a couple of effects that are going on. And this is our first kind of real sort of performance modeling example I want to show because we also, we know significantly from an aerodyne, um, from a physiological point of view, that exercise at altitude slows you down. And I'm gonna pick up on some of the detail and the reasons for that in a moment. And it's quite significant, even at the, what is relatively modest altitude of, of the velodrome in Mexico. But this is the key physics slide that we need to consider. Because we know at Aguascalantes, just shy of 2,000 meters, that the air density is about 20% lower. And that means your physical power to achieve the speed, you'll go a lot faster for the same power. Or flip it around the other way, to achieve the same speed will require a lot less power because of that air density, that aerodynamic drag is effect is lower. And we're looking at a roundabout to achieve a rider that can hold 400 watts on the at sea level um, and the speed 51 and a bit kilometers an hour that that's 55 and a bit kilometers an hour that that equates to 
400 watts at sea level is about just shy of 330 watts at that level of altitude. And this is typical of what we would expect for someone like Alex and his performance of 400 watts at sea level is pretty typical for that. Now that's with a coefficient of drag area for somebody who's incredibly well optimized at 0.17 meters per uh, squared, which is getting to where Alex will be going into that race. He could be up in that region where actually it might not be quite as aerodynamic as that. And he's got a lot of testing to do over the next 10 days when he's out there to figure out all those small little things that work or hopefully work for him with clothing choices to take him into that sort of region. Um, and that allows us to give us a good sense of what is achievable, because if we know that the power is reduced for a given speed, we can get a sense of just how fast the rider might be able to go because of that um, uh, being at altitude. But it's not just a physics equation, it's a physiological equation as well. And because we know at this sort of altitude, Aguis Scalantes, that the reduction in physiological capacity, the reduction in uh, the athlete's aerobic capabilities is quite significant. So there's some good data, some, this is good composite data on the left-hand sh side showing that at that sort of level of altitude, then we're expecting somewhere in the region of about a 12% loss in aerobic capacity. So best part of 50 watts loss in power because the air is thinner and that ability to get oxygen in at the mouth and into the muscle is reduced. That's on average. It could be if you're incredibly well acclimated to altitude that actually it's not quite as much of a decrement. And uh, maybe we're looking, but we're still looking nearly at 10% uh, loss. And that would be the best case scenario. But it could also be the other way. That actually for somebody who's not uh, at all well suited to altitude, not acclimated and has a big effect, that even at what this is reasonably modest altitude, there's a very significant, the best part of 20% loss in um, aerobic capability and, that, and the equivalent power. I think for somebody like Alex at that sort of level of altitude and that sort of level of physiological capacity, probably looking at something around about there. We know people who are fitter, have the bigger engines, the bigger aerobic capabilities will suffer proportionally more at altitude. Um, the effects are more amplified because of the, if, uh, for a number of reasons, but we're probably looking at around about a 60 to 65 watt loss in power at that sort of altitude, which gives him weapons of about 335 to 340 watts available power. Let's take those two things um, together. So we've been talking about it, the physiological um, capabilities you can take into the race and the phys physics aerodynamics um, scenario of being at altitude and the thinner air and the higher speed. And when we take those two together, available power and the power required for the speed, we get this. This is the relationship of that altitude elevation for somebody of his aerodynamic capabilities and that power if he has the average response that at our expected, well, in this case, likely physiological response with that aerodynamic profile, we're expecting probably that he's going to have what we think about enough to have a, some sort of margin over the record um, as it stands. Not a great deal, but enough to make it worth considering to go out to that, uh, to go out all the way to Mexico to try this, to try this record. That's a, probably a good likely scenario, um, but it could very well be um, that actually, you know, you've got to then the, Everything's got to come right on in an hour record, including the aerodynamics. And that's the biggest factor here. And you can see this in this case, that change in aerodynamics. If, if you're taking a rider in who's not got the, the, fully, the full aerodynamic um, capabilities optimized, then it becomes very difficult to achieve that. And he might fall short. I think he's in this region somewhere between 55.1, the existing record, and about 55.7. But there's a lot of caveats to that. I think he's in that region. There's a lot of caveats to that. Is that, you know, it's delivering this on the day. Um, it's about having that coefficient of drag area holding true when you're giving it full beans and you're fatigued and you're right on the edge of things and your body is moving around. And there's all technical aspects around the track surface. Um, and of course, actually the physiological cost of delivering that sort of record. A good rule of thumb just to take into that is that every, every lap of the track 
um, that you're, you're watching the rider do is about five watts more power or less. So a single watt of power is about 50 meters th further over an hour record. You think about the margins that these records are beaten by, typically no more than about a lap of the track. You're looking at about a five watt margin here or there. First of all, the hour record, you never go as far as you think. Um, and I think it's all about actually knowing what you're capable of and just beating it enough be, um, by, by enough when you're up there. But very best of luck to him. And I hope he, uh, I hope he does achieve it. So we talked a little bit there about the, the physical capabilities of the rider. And um, what I wanted to do now, just to go, uh, the phys physiological capabilities at, at, at altitude, what I want to just dive in a little bit deeper into this, um, just to pick up on a few of the areas that um, really, when we're talking about performance modeling, we can actually not just talk about the physics and the aerodynamics, but we can talk about the physiological model of what it takes to win, what it takes physically to achieve the cycling performance. This is a, what I've got in front of you here is a typical um, reporting panel we used to use with our clients at the Bourbon Center when they came in to do a physiological profiling and uh, with us, um, a variety of exercise tests in the, in the laboratory using power all the way through and various measures that are in there as well. Um, but the, probably the, the one thing I really just want to point out to you is what's exists, what's going on in the top right of the screen there. The idea of a power profile, in this case, from short duration, maximal effort power through to long duration, three hour power. The performance model of where this individual's strengths and weaknesses are in comparison to, again, what is normal, what is average, what is good, what is excellent, what's exceptional. And that idea of getting under the bonnet of the physiological rider and figuring out how their um, performance has been achieved is, is, of course, nothing new. Chris was doing it himself. He was a pioneer of that back in the uh, 30 years ago. Um, and it's, it's not new from a physiological perspective because um, we've always been, and this is my bag, this is what I am um, spend my time doing in the laboratory, it's not exactly doing what's going on here, is looking into that in-depth physiological performer and trying to figure out the steps of the physiological model, their performance model, or in this case of an aerobic performer, of getting air in at the mouth and how the, the lungs and the heart and the circulation and the muscle all use that oxygen to achieve performance. Um, I'm going to skip on from this slide, but you might want to just come back to it later on and have a good look at it. Uh, it's pretty eye-opening. And that idea of getting under the bonnet, as I say, of the physiological performer, figuring out where the performance is coming from, is something we would do routinely to figure out um, their strengths, their weaknesses, and the various components, as we saw in the, in the overview graphic before, of what makes up their performance. In this individual, you'll see some of the data in here around, his, um, around things like efficiency and fueling uh, and how economical he is. And that's something I'm going to pick up on right at the end. So we have an aerodynamic model. We have a physical model. The aerodynamic model you've seen so far is a track model, which is really quite simple. It's mostly about um, pushing wind out the way, a little bit about rolling resistance. But when you're out on the open road, which we saw with the Tour de France example, then we know we're going, the ride is going up and down. You're going to have wind blowing in different directions. And all these things can be included in the, in the uh, performance model. And I just wanted to pick up on this, and this is I'm going to push towards the finish of this in a moment. Um, this is some uh, proof of concept stuff we did about probably about 12 years ago now. I think this came out uh, 10 years ago. This would have been so the data is from about 11 years ago, where we were interested in asking this question of can we take what we did on we can, we do on the track and figure out does it hold true on the road? Um, you might recognise the rider in question as Julia Shaw when she was in her prime um, about 10 years ago. Now, Julia was a really powerful rider. Um, you can see some of the data here showing the power number she was able to sustain for different durations, 20 minutes for a 10 mile time trial, 53 minutes for 25 miles, a critical power of 300 watts, 299 watts, and an anaerobic work capacity there of 15.6 um, kilojoules. So a powerful physical rider. I put that data up as the physiological data she was ahead of her time aerodynamically. She had a very good coefficient of drag area, 0.185. And you can see how well that physiological data in terms of predicted power 
based on the critical power actually holds true to real life power in the races pretty close within a few watts, within about five to eight watts difference between the actual and predicted. But that's just the power measured at the, at the pedal. What we then did with that data was we actually then said, well, okay, so if we know the predicted power that you're able to achieve for different duration, different durations, in this case, different distances, all the way up to 100 miles, you can see some of the data, the numbers that, that are involved there. Then can we use our aerodynamic modeling and course modeling to actually make a prediction and estimation of what that time is going to be on the road, the speed and time on the road? And you can see in this data here just how well, how accurately that prediction holds true to the actual race time. And even in a hundred mile race, three and three quarter hours, you're only looking at around about a 30 second difference between the prediction and the action and the actual. And this is over rolling road with wind blowing in different directions and different rolling resistances of the surface and so on. But the, but the, the modeling of the performance holds true in reality out on the open road. So it's encouraging that we can use this, we can take this those models that have been uh, developed and validated on the track actually stop showing that they will hold true on the on the open road. So pretty good um, estimation, as we say, uh, of the actual time. It's just worth putting this up that a lot of work goes into making that picture on the right hand side and look at the sort of differences in the physical uh, the physical cost of or the speed that you can achieve for the physical cost. Um, in comparison, this is in the space of about three years of work from the left to the right-hand pitcher. Exceptional athlete um, and exceptional performances. So now we have a model here. So let's just recap where we've got to so far. We've got a physical model of what the rider is able to achieve in terms of power. And we're going to push on to that in a second for the final um, section of this. And we, we know we can actually make some estimations of what happens on the road according to whether the rider the rider's aerodynamic profile and whether that is poor in the red average to good in the green to to excellent to exceptional in the blue and the purple so a real understanding of where that um, physical power on the left hand side is going to equate to um, actual speed on the road in uh, different duration events there so we now really have got all the component parts of our performance model. We've got the physics, we've got the physiology, and of course, we've got a little bit about the tactics. And when I talk about tactics, we're talking about actually that idea of pushing hard in certain areas of the course to get more out of it on the uphills in this case and into the headwinds. The physical model we can also, uh, the physiological model, we can also categorize according to those standards. And this is really what performance modeling is about. It's about figuring out what good looks like. And we've got a rider in this case here who's got proportionally probably better um, physical capabilities over the longer distances. So someone who's suited to, to the longer distance time trials. And that allows us, with the knowledge of all those component parts, that allows us to then say, okay, on the open road, in this case, this is the Beijing um, time trial course, uh, sorry, the Rio time trial, but upon the Rio time trial course, uh, the Rio Olympics time trial course. And we can start to actually take all those component parts of the physics and the physiology to actually actually make some predictions about, well, if we improve the individual's uh, aerodynamics, where are we going to get um, those performance gains? And you can see, in this case, 10% improvement in, a, in, the, um, in the coefficient of drag area, reduction of coefficient of drag, quite a significant effect on performance. We can model, well, let's just push harder on the bike. So a power improvement, in this case, a 5% improvement in power. And you can see how that really starts to return on the uphills here. You can see on the two, the two hills. If we reduce the system mass, let's get some lighter kit. Um, again, some performance gains on, significantly on the, on the uphills. We're gonna go uphills quicker, not necessarily gonna come down them any quicker, of course. And it allows us to give an understanding of where we should put our emphasis into our performance, into our um, expected performance. Where are we going to beat the the best time or the the champion? Which bits should we get fitter? Should we get more aerodynamic? Should we get lighter? Of course, all things work together. But where and how can we put our emphasis and our, and our effort and our focus into those things? And it brings us back to this point that you know. 
what we were doing with this data uh, for this rider, um, as I just hasten to add, it's not the two guys on the screen, is taking all those physiological aspects and understanding the ind individual's critical power, anaerobic speed reserve, anaerobic work capacity, the course, the wind around the actual race, the course and the elevation, and even the road surface to actually then say, well, we can give you, in this case, a pacing strategy that's going to get you to the finish line in the best possible shape and save you the most amount of time by attacking in the right places on the uphills into the headwinds. In this case, based around the physiological, physical capabilities and constraints of the rider, um, most specifically. So the rider gets to the finish line, that final section, and he's given everything and um, falls across the finish line knowing that he couldn't could not have distributed, uh, delivered his effort any better through that race. And that really is kind of where I want to leave it uh, now as, as, the, as the final point there, because, you know, what we've got here, it, 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 it's, it does sound quite singular that we're looking at how we can achieve a performance. But I think really we have to take that back a step because what we're trying to do with optimizing a rider physically and uh, aerodynamically and technically and biomechanically is find solutions that allow them as an individual to be the best that they can be. You know, we, I put the quote on there, not everyone can be world-class at everything, but some people can be world-class at something. And that's really what we're trying to get into when we're doing this, the idea of profiling an individual to find where the strengths and weaknesses are and which bits we should concentrate on to, to try and improve um, if they've got room for that improvement. I say not everyone could be world-class at everything. Well, this guy ran a sub two hour marathon, but he's not world-class at everything. He's world-class at a few things. And I wanted to put this up, not cycling, it's running, but it's a really nice example of understanding three very significant physiological components of endurance performance. So the individual's VO2 max on the left-hand side, what they can sustain over the course of a race, in this case, over the course of a marathon, the um, VO2, percent VO2 peak at their lactate turn point or critical power, and then their oxygen cost, how economical they are. If we know those three components of, in, of their endurance capabilities, we can get a very good understanding of their, their performance, um, li their likely performance standard. And as a runner himself, this guy is not the best. He's above average. But you can see that these individuals, these East African runners um, in their lab um, data, that some of them have got actually quite modest VO2 max scores, but they're all sub 210 marathon runners. They're all world-class marathon runners, and including, as we see, someone who's a sub two hour, um, two hour, two, 202, 203, 204 every time he'll go and race. But he's not world-class at everything. So the performance model, you can be, you don't have to be world-class at every component all of the time but you're world-class at some things some of the time. And that's how we can get that indi um, real good indication and good insight into someone's performance. And I want to just put this final data up, just bring it back to cycling um, and the, some of the physiological data is, this is um, some data from a couple of riders actually, where you can see the differences in VO2 max score on the right-hand side, somebody with an exceptional VO2 max, 82 mils per kilogram per minute, and somebody with a good, but, um, lesser VO2 max 68, but achieving the same performance in terms of power at the pedal by virtue of the rider on the bottom being far more economical, far more efficient and, for, and using less oxygen to achieve a given power or more importantly, uh, producing more power for the same amount of oxygen. So again, it's showing us that the performance model can flex in different directions. You're never going to be great at everything all the time, but in this case, this individual multiple st uh, stage winner of the Tour de France, reasonably modest VO2 max for um, a world-class athlete, but exceptional, exceptional economy. His, that side of the performance model for him is where his strengths are. And that's really our goal here is trying to understand that broader picture of the individual across all these components of, their, of what makes up their performance. Profiling them in this case and seeing where we've got opportunity across their strengths and weaknesses to try and make some improvements through training and into that. And there, and um, hopefully that's been a useful whistle-stop tour of a few examples of how we can take physics, how we can take the physiology and bring them together into uh, 
uh, to improve performance, but firstly to understand performance. Um, I'm going to take. I'm going to cast my eyes now over to the to the chat to see if we can pick up on some questions, and hopefully Bianca's got some for me. Thanks for your attention, everybody. Thank you very much, Jamie. Always a pleasure to listen to you. Um, James Sprague, he's probably like the first one that's uh, pinged the question over, so I can put that on the screen. And he's asked a little bit more about Alex specifically, so I'm not sure if you have the insight into this, but he said, how might you go about estimating Alex's CP at 1900 metres? Would it be modelled or would it be tested? Yeah, it's a good question, uh, James. I wouldn't expect any, anything less from you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the key thing there is, yes, you could do physiological profiling and testing, but performance data, power data from training is going to tell you 95, 99% of the story. And so those various, um, we always used to do with altitude um, camps when we're sending athletes, runners, and cyclists and rowers up to altitude is to have a period of adjustment where you're actually, in most cases, really sort of easing yourself into it when you're there and you're doing some sort of incremental type exercise as part of your warm up. And really get, if you've got a feel for the numbers, for power, for heart rate and for effort, maybe even other some markers that you could put in there, like um, some physiological markers like lactate and so on. And you get a good sense of how much things are moving and how much um, decrement you might have at altitude and hopefully in the time that you've adapted and acclimated, those things will, uh, will um, be mitigated a bit. So to answer the question, it will be then just getting out there, you know, and there's a period there of, of getting out there and trying stuff, trying stuff physically to see are the numbers where we'd expect them to be. And aerodynamically, again, are the numbers where we'd expect them to be and are things, are things working um, out on the track at those sort of speeds. So it's a bit of a bit of a suck it and see, um, but most importantly, using that power number in front of you, so you, you can be objective about it. Sorry, Jamie, I muted myself there. <laughs> Rookie error. Um, there was a question on Instagram that I suspect relates to um, who might be the best person to go to if you were looking to analyse your data in this capacity. So, you know, for example, would it be a physiologist? Might be a coach, for example. Uh, Alex obviously um, works very well with Hutch. Who's driving that and how might you, I think in this case, contextually, um, mm. makes sense of it all. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, a lot of this is now, you know, aspects of this are now becoming actually not standard, but they're actually being incorporated into um, things like Strava and Best Bike Split that we saw there. Okay. So there is accessibility, uh, you know, to, um, to that's become a lot better over the years. Um, you're right, I think this is the domain of a coach, a good coach who can really see all these components of the performance um, you know, I've talked tonight about physiological and aerodynamic aspects of the performance model, but that's just a small technical part. And there's a much, much bigger behavioral part and lifestyle part and training and everything else that goes with being, a, um, being an athlete at any level that the coach and the athlete have to figure out that relationship to, to, to hold on to that and to manage that. Um, the technical aspects, as I say, you got here, then some of the skills and some of the capabilities for that are becoming more open access. It's what we do at Vortec and what we used to do at Boardman um, to actually do that for, do the heavy lifting for a client, uh, for, for an individual, for a team, for a coach, for a performance director, um, by providing the, the um, you know, the means to do that. Um, I, I, I like the fact that you used the phrase coach there because I think that's really important that if the coach can get a handle on these things, then they're, they're getting a really good understanding of, of holding on to the performance. Thanks, Jamie. Um, another question that came up actually was, um, how important is it, I think, to factor in nutrition when you're um, analysing uh, the the data towards a given goal, really? Because um, I know you've got some slides up there that are looking at um, energy consumption, etc. cetera. Uh, mm again how how important is that and i guess is it dependent on the event 
Yeah, that's really good. Um, do you want to just can you put my um, screen back up, please, Bianca? Uh, yeah, you just need to share it, I think, from your end, and then I can... Okay, let's see if I can do that. Hold on one second. Um, let's see if we can just do that. I wonder, okay. actually, how many people um, think to record this. I know it's gained traction uh, at the, recently with a lot of discussions about Red S. If you find the slide, Jamie, then I can share that. But, um, yeah, I guess it's also something that can be difficult to measure because I know a lot of the devices might try to calculate it based on perceived work from heart rate etc but um yes you can still hear me okay there Bianca by the way yeah I can yeah um so... yeah don't worry I'm, I'm not going to share a screen I don't really need to with that um yeah you know this is you know probably a really good example of something like this is the Ironman triathlon where you have an individual it is an individual race um for, certainly through the through the bike um and the run where all the physiological and physical and aerodynamic modeling will still hold true, but you've got to deliver it after eight hours, you know, seven hours, 40, whatever you might be, you might be doing. And, and that's a nutrition, that's a nutrition equation. That's a fueling equation. That's a muscle damage equation. That's a heat equation. And so the realities of that, you know, becoming actually your performance model is all nice, elegant and accurate and precise. But it could actually crumble in an instant if you if one part of it uh, you know um, isn't isn't seen to uh, the nutrition part of it. Uh, we've got a question from Jamie here, which you can probably again see, and he said, "What are your thoughts on making use of data from the field, um, particularly when looking at uh, the no show, for example?" And I would guess the Aero Lab as well, which is one that's um, that's been released yeah. recently. Yeah, really good. Um, you know, the so long as you're using them properly, and you know, you're you. And I think there's also an aspect there of, of repeating, repeating, repeating. So you know, you know how what the, the data looks and feels like, so you can interpret it. Um, but they're good. They are what they are, and the the tech in that area is getting better and better every iteration. Um, it doesn't replace the wind tunnel. It doesn't replace the track. But it does give you live measurements of 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 what's going on, and and as so long as you can interpret it accordingly and correctly, then uh, yeah, that's it's, it's really good. Um, I think there's a real nice balance between using stuff that's in the field like that and coming into the precision of a wind tunnel, and you could even take it even further to, towards computational fluid dynamics (CFD). But fundamentally, the, like we've talked about all the time, the rider's got to get out there and deliver it. And actually understanding how they move on the bike and how some of those very precise numbers might actually be quite blurry out on the open road is an important part of the whole model. And I guess an extension of that question might be as well. Um, is the accuracy also not dependent on the individual using it? So, for example, if you've got a coach or someone like yourself who's relatively well versed in the mathematics behind all of this, whereas someone else might be you know thinking about buying this kit for home use do you think there'll be discrepancies in that data yes is the answer to the question um you have to be careful as i say they're getting better every time and the software is getting better in the way that you can use them um there's a bit of a challenge with some of the on the on bike devices around rolling resistance so you have to be you know if, if the road surface is is quite different uh, it's quite it can be quite a and, you, and you, you're not putting that into the into the mix, then um, you'll get some slightly misleading data. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think I said before about repeating and repeating, like any good scientist making observation after observation. So you know what it looks like when the data is stable, and you know what a change looks like, and how to you know interpret that as being meaningful, mm -hmm. not just noise. Um, but I, I think they're great. They're great tools, and no doubt they're going to get cheaper and cheaper and you know in the same way that a power meter was once the domain an srm power meter was once the domain of the professional athlete 20 25 years ago uh, and with the price accordingly now you know that's become standard to the point that you know it's standard on some bikes that you can buy off, off the peg mm. 
We've got one from Tom here and he says, what would you consider to be the main limitations of current performance prediction models? So um, is it breaking in the corners? Can the wet weather affect the grip with the tyres on the road? Um, yeah. For example, how much does this create variability in data? Yeah, it's a really nice question, actually. And people have tried to incorporate these aspects into models. Um, uh, you know, there's really great. You can do that. You can look at acceleration, deceleration in and out of corners, uh, lean angles. You can go to all that sort of level. Um, and of course, surface traction and so on. The rider's still got to go and deliver it. Um, but we often do a post hoc overlay, if you like, of the optimized strategy, the optimized power strategy of the rider and their actual strategy and overlay the two together to see how close they agree. And they'll never 100 percent agree. And often where you see the discrepancies are on corners or where there's an acceleration out of a corner um, or braking and so on. You can account for them, you can model for them. But, um, you know, I think in some senses, this is where actually you know, the limitations to the rider, apart from falling off because they lose grip, but the limitations to the rider are, are typically their physical capabilities and how good their aerodynamics can be. Um, I like the point there about variability of real world CDA. It links into what we've just been talking about with on-bike measurements of that. But that's a really important concept in itself. So it's not just a single CDA number. It's actually uh, what this looks like when you're giving it full gas. Mm -hmm. How much does your body move? What's the range you're playing in? And, and you know, it, how critical, how close to the edge of something something might be and fall off the edge if, for whatever reason, you change, your head comes up slightly. So those are really important, I think, um, you know, factors that variance is actually as important as the average. I'm sure that most of the people watching tonight realise that the hour record is not a single paced effort. Um, but how might you go about pacing an hour record, for example, in terms of acceleration? Well, the key thing is the you know when you're going in and out of the bends, um, you're getting a variation in power, a sinusoidal variation in power, and the really really good riders who are well track versed can minimise that peak to trough uh, height. And so that those little surges of power as you come out of the bend and back into the straight where the bike almost feels like it's slowing down, you push on, you're trying to minimize those so they don't cost as much. So there's a skill, there's a skill of riding, you know, there might be an average power line, but that wavy line either side of it is a skill of trying to minimize that. Um, so it, it, is, it, it is an average, it is an average power event, but it is that slight variation as well. Um, and that comes from, you know, that comes from, uh, yeah, track skills, but it also comes from practice and so on and so forth. And of course, the faster you go, the harder those things become because the centripetal force, the G-force on the rider gets higher and higher. Fascinating. It'd be interesting to see what happens uh, come November. Well, I, think... I just want to re reiterate that point that you never go as far as you think you're going to in an hour record. And I think if you asked anyone who's ever tried one and beaten one, um, then if they have gone as far as they think they could have done, they probably could have gone more. <laughs> but I think what you'll see is that when somebody's right on the limits of it, it's actually finding the limit and backing away from it a little bit so you know you can get to the end of the ride. You saw Dan Bigham and Joss allowed in, in recent weeks doing a couple of terrific records, absolutely sensational records. They knew exactly what they were doing and exactly what they were taking into that. Um, so I'm really fingers crossed for Alex, but it's, uh, it, it ain't going to be easy. I think that covers all of the questions, JP. So is there anything else to add from yourself? Well, I think the probably final thing is that, well, thank you, first of all, um, Bianca, for the invite and for people's attention. But the final thing is, you know, we're talking about quite sophisticated things here. But then, you know, in another 10 years time, some of this will be old hat, you know, and how things move on. There are innovators out there, your Graham O'Brees of the world, your Dan Biggums of the world, um, who have pushed, you know, pushed the envelope and figured out better, more efficient, newer ways of doing things. And I'd love to be able to reconvene in 10 years time, Bianca, and, and look back on that. And, and we'll probably see that the hour record has probably gone on a whole bunch of other steps. Um, and who knows who's going to hold it next after after Alex and beyond and, and so on. Um, but yeah, Times always change, uh, things always move on. Um, and it's really, it, it's nice to be able to be part of that, but it's also nice to be able to just watch that and see how that progresses. 
thanks jamie um we won't take up any more of your time now thank you so much for giving up your time voluntarily <laughs> we've got um james actually james sprague talking on the next one so he'll probably um extend on some of your conversations around force production etc as uh, james is going to talk about talk um and how forces will vary depending on set parameters really which will have a little bit of relevance to the national hill climb as well i can't remember if it's i think it would just be after the the hill climb as well so um if you have a little look out we'll post a link to that in due course uh, but otherwise it's a farewell from me and no doubt jamie so thanks for watching cheers thanks everyone